to just make sure you note these things for your objectives. I know you can do the objectives, like what, what do I do with this? All right, any questions? So remember this, polar covalent bonds hold a water together. Let's just review where we left off last time. When we're taking a look at H2O, it's called H2 because there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. And when one of the things I don't like about this illustration is I would put Stick these here just to note that one of those electrons comes from each of the hydrogens. It seems a little ambiguous there. Um, anyway, so on what happens is, is that the oxygen and the hydrogens bump their outer shells together so that they can share electrons so that. Each individual hydrogen has a full outer shell of two. It has one, it shares one. This one has one, shares one. So again, I put them there. The oxygen has six in its outer shell. So shares again, sharing one with each individual hydrogen and then it has four others as well. So that gives oxygen a full outer shell of eight and gives each hydrogen a full outer shell of two. One of the things to remember is that we call this a polar covalent bond situation because polar means two opposite sides. When we say there are two opposite sides of the water compound, what we mean is two things. So one is, is that there's an oxygen side and there's a hydrogen, hydrogen side. So there's two different sides. The other thing it gets into a little bit about the attraction of the protons for the electrons. And so when we take a look at oxygen, oxygen has a proton, um, eight protons in its nucleus. Each hydrogen has one proton in their nucleus. So because you've got eight protons here, as opposed to even if we added the two on this side, the two, what happens is because you have a larger positive center to the oxygen, all of the electrons are more attracted to the oxygen side. And what that does is it gives them, you can see here, a slightly negative charge because the electrons are attracted to this side of the water compound. You can see then that you've got these two positive protons, one for each of the hydrogens hanging out on this side, which gives it a slightly positive, positive side, slightly positive charge. Um, when we say slightly positive or slightly negative, you make this kind of funny S for slightly positive, and that kind of funny S for slightly negative. This is going to have a huge influence on how hydrogen <coughs> bonds are formed. So let's move into hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are the attraction of a positive, even a small, slightly positive charge for a small, slightly negative charge. Very similar to the way ionic bonds work. Remember, ionic bonds were the attraction of a positive ion for a negative ion. If we just had one water to one water, this would be a weak bond. But because we have so much water in biological molecules, and just in general on the Earth, the Earth's surface is covered by about 70% water, very similar to how much water cells or organisms are made of, that there's a lot of water around. So, um, so for example, like.
when we take a look at two waters, what we see is that two water compounds will form a hydrogen bond with one another. The positive side of one of the waters with the negative side, the oxygen side of the other. And so like an ionic bond, if you just had two of them, they could easily just pull apart and the water could go, each water could go and be part of another chemical reaction. But in reality, because so much water is around, like I said, on the earth or in cells or organisms, um, in whole like multicellular organisms, we have so much water that this starts happening. And you start getting a lot of hydrogen bonds in one area and the waters start to kind of go around and around and around one another and you know I mentioned this in the end of lecture last time that what this does all of these waters that start to bond around and around and around one another starts to make all these little hydrogen bonds make that much stronger of a structure. So that water, while it is liquid, gives this impression of when you have a lot of it, of being more solid than liquid. When you have other structures, like we're about, uh, 20, let's say just on average, 25% of our body is other things, 75% is water. And so those other 25% with the water makes us like a really solid thing rather than like a jellyfish. Um, jellyfish are 95% water and only 5% other stuff. So, um, but still, even a jellyfish, it's like if you take a jellyfish out of water, the form on land just is like a pile of jelly, but it's kind of like a gummy bear that it's like hard, it'd be hard to just pull that apart because still the hydrogen bonds of that 5% of other molecules and compounds with the water still makes it somewhat of a solid. Very fascinating. So these hydrogen bonds are very, very important in giving structure and function to complex organisms. So remember, again, that hydrogen bonds, or H bonds, hold two water together. Alone, weak, but water's never alone. There's always a lot of water available. So let's look at some examples of properties that this affects and how. So this is like a nicer version of my picture. All right, so water molecules are cohesive. They stick to each other. This is like if you've ever done a belly flop where you dive into water and you smack maybe part of your body or you um, smack your hand on water and it hurts. That's because of this hydrogen bonding makes those molecules strong. And it gives the effect of having a surface to it rather than just like, we know we can put our hands through water, but if you smack the top of water, it will hurt. So that's what we call surface tension, is that when something hits water, water has a distinct surface to it. If you watch the Olympics, oh, we were so into the Olympics this summer, the divers, the high divers, 
you will have noticed that they always point their fingers like this or like this or their toes their toes are always pointed and what they're doing is they're trying to break the surface tension and so they're trying to use things like their nails or the tips of their fingers to open up that surface so that they can slide through safely if you fell off a bridge and you landed on water you could die it's like hitting concrete that's how hard it is from 10 stories up there's other animals that use surface tension for survival so for example this is called the bacillus lizard and it runs across water to get away from predators same thing there's some spiders that do that if you've ever seen those water striders they go on the surface of water and they use that they just kind of like look like they're almost like hovering but they're actually using the surface tension to get around on top of water <clears throat> water comes out of our faucet in a stream rather than individual compounds again hydrogen bonding keeps them together into that stream you might get splashes of little bits of little drops of water right it comes out of the sink and some of it splashes because it's hitting the surface of the bottom of the sink and that's separating some of this because that is a hard surface too. Trees, it allows trees who absorb water from their roots to pull water all the way up to the top of the tree. Trees like this, like a sequoia, which can be 300 feet tall, it can be 30 stories or more tall, some of them 400 feet tall, pull their water from the roots. So this surface, I mean, excuse me, this hydrogen bonding allows for almost like a reverse faucet instead of the water coming out the water comes this way the water has to fight gravity to go up through the top of the all the way up to the top of the tree um, that is just due again to the hydrogen bonding our second one is water is adhesive so cohesive sticks to itself adhesive means it sticks to something else Because of the polarity here, these positive and negatives, water can stick to other polar surfaces as well. And so when we're talking about the property of adhesion, we're looking at not only do we have a lot of water in our body, but we've got other things like fats, um, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids, that these larger compounds will also have some areas that are charged. And so when they have a charge, that a negative charged area will stick to water. The other thing that's pretty you know, amazing about this is that there might be various areas of the protein because proteins fats are large that when you have all of these different kind of surfaces of the protein that you will get water like the oxygen side will stick over here and so then you can have again waters all over sticking to various surfaces of all of the other compounds that are in our body. If you've ever noticed that sometimes you can fill water with liquid, I mean, you could fill a cup with liquid, and that liquid, sometimes it goes over the top of the glass that's the adhesion that it's kind of like both the cohesion and the adhesion that the water sticking so tightly to itself 
but also that it is sticking to the glass so tightly that you can overfill a glass without the water or the other liquid just pouring out. Water has a high heat of vaporization, vapor or steam, taking water from a liquid state into a gaseous state. It takes a lot of energy or heat to make water change its form from liquid to gaseous or from liquid to solid. The strong bonds allow water to not only cover the surface, but to cover around the surface in a vapor state as well. We call it humidity. And what this does is that this humidity on the earth, it allows for us to have a really great atmosphere where water is available to living things all the time. If our bodies are on average 75% water, and we're going to next talk about how water is super important for making molecules and breaking molecules apart of what we would refer to as our metabolism, that we need water constantly, and we know that, right? Dehydrated people, organisms, they don't survive. And that's because we need water to make and break all the stuff within our body. This vaporization is super important so that water is available in the air, just like our lungs, for example. Our lungs, which are on the inside of our body, but take in air, which can be very dry, that with humidity in the air, we can also get water inside and moisturize our lungs from the outer air to our insides as well. When we get hot, water vapor comes out of our pores. And as that vapor in sweat form, as it gets taken off of our body, it also takes off the heat of our body as well. So the whole point of sweating is to cool you off. It helps you when you're really, really hot to pull heat off of your body with the water vapor. So let's do a little review. Which of the figures below depicts stable atoms? So either this one or this one. So take a look. Let's remember what, what did stability mean? What was an atom or element looking to do number two. to have a full, to have full stability? Indeed. Okay, so good, good, good. <clears throat> so when we take a look at this, is A stable? No. Okay, so what does it want? It wants a full outer shell. It's got one in its outer shell. So it's either looking to give away that one or it's looking to accept seven. Likely it will give away one. Let's take a look at B. B's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So B has seven in its outer shell. It is not full, it is not stable. Now if we look at C, What's happened to A here is that it has given away one of its electrons to D. So these two work together, that this one here is giving its electron to that one there. This one had one, this one had seven, needs one. So what this is implying in this situation here when we look at C and D is that C has given away its one electron which we didn't want to put on the illustration, but in giving away one electron, it got a full outer shell. Yeah, it got a full outer shell, and it has a positive charge now. This one has accepted an extra electron. It had seven, now it's got eight, and that gives it a slight, or gives it a negative charge. So here, What is formed then is an ionic bond. Remember that the ionic bond is the attraction of a positive ion for a negative ion. But this electron that was here, that was given to D from C to D, 
they can always take it back. So you can always say, give me that back and I'm gonna go bond with something else. So it's not a super strong bond, but it is a bond nonetheless. So number two is correct. All right, a little bit about other things that revolve around water. Acids and bases. Acids are a molecule that has a high amount of hydrogen ions, or H pluses, that hydrogen ion. On the pH scale, the pH scale goes from zero to 14. Acids have a pH of less than seven. Bases have a high amount of hydroxide ions, or OH negative. They are on the upper part of the pH scale, so they have a pH of greater than seven. If you took one of these hydrogen ions and combined it with a hydroxide ion, what are we going to form? What's two H's and an oxygen? Water, yeah. So water is right there in the middle at seven, and it's neutral. It has an equal amount of hydroxide and hydrogen ions together. So kind of interesting what would happen here is these two would give their electrons back in terms of um, ionic bonds, and then they would go in and form a covalent bond. So here you can see again, a hydroxide ion and a hydrogen ion, they will form water. This is indicative of bases, and the hydrogen ion is indicative of acids. All right, so pH scale. We call them acids and bases, or we call it the acidity and basicity of solutions. We're measuring on a scale different, how much hydrogen ions does something have? It gets into a logarithmic scale. We're gonna make it simple and just reflect on that. We go from zero to 14, seven in the middle is neutral, below seven is acidic, and above 7 to 14 is basic. So you have a picture below that shows you a bunch of different solutions that are in our world. And let's just take a look at where they fall on the pH scale then. So right in the middle, water is approximately neutral. It would have to be totally 100% pure water. Usually water is in its hydrogen bonding state, having that slightly positive and slightly negative sides. It will bond to other things very quickly. Um, like water from the tap will not be perfectly neutral because there'll be other things like fluoride, for example, in water. Milk is very close to neutral. Blood is also very close, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, and then if we get into some of the bases, baking soda, just a little bit basic. Um, baking soda makes for a really nice cleaner, very cheap. Instead of using, um, like you might use like Comet or Barkeeper's Friend um, to scrub stuff, this is a nice cheap and more um, healthy way to clean stuff. Toothpaste is a bit basic. It's going to try and get the acid that's built up by the bacteria on our teeth and take that away. And then you get into a lot of your cleaners which become a lot more dangerous. That's why there's always like a poison symbol on there and the number for <coughs> poison control on most of your cleaners. Um, if you've ever cleaned an oven with like a can of oven cleaner spray, and you spray that into your oven and a little of the vapor gets into your eyes, it burns, right? 
So we have to be careful when you're cleaning with some of these very highly basic solutions. All right, so now let's go the other way. Um, things that are acidic, coffees, like between five and seven, depending on what you put in it. Like if you put milk and coffee, it makes it a little less acidic. Um, things like beer, drinks, sodas will be more on this side. If we're talking about like cola, for example, it's even more acidic. That's why they say like, um, if you get blood on something using seltzer water or even any kind of pop, uh, it's good cleaner because it will start to like foam and have a reaction with like blood or whatever you stained your clothes with. It will actually like that reaction will help a bit and it being a little bit acidic helps to get out that stain. Foods like tomatoes are on about four-ish and then you get into your citrus, which start to get more and more acidic. Lemon, if you ever squeezed a lemon and a little bit it got in your eye, it burns because it's a pretty strong acid. Um, lemon makes a really good cleaner also, that if you combine lemon with baking soda, it's really good for getting stains out on plates or like pans. Another ni nice natural thing you can do at home. And this is like so fascinating to me that our stomachs, our bodies, produce one of the strongest acids out there. Hydrochloric acid helps to break down the food that we eat. They're pretty amazing that we produce an, our own very, very strong acid. All right, so why do we talk about this? Why is pH important to living things? One of the things about cells and whole organisms is that we don't want them to wildly become like basic and then acidic. And other places we call homeostasis. Homeostasis, again, this is um, mentioned in the first chapter when we were talking about the characteristics of living things, that homeostasis is a steady state to make things calm, peaceful. We want all of that in our body. We talked about homeostasis in terms of body temperature that we don't want our body temperature to go too high or too low. And then pH is another part of our homeostasis, is that we want to maintain a pH around seven for most of our cells. Uh, stomach is an exception. In our stomach, we actually want a very low pH in our stomach. And so it's one of the few places in our body that requires a low pH to function well. That if you're, um, like if you're somebody who gets a lot of stomach aches or has like a heartburn, um, you want to wait a little bit after you eat to take an antacid, like a Tums for example, because that will mess with the digestion of your food. You won't properly digest your food because you're going to start to neutralize the hydrochloric acid in your stomach. So you want to wait just like a little bit for that as well. Not lay down if you're somebody who suffers from like a GERD or acid reflux, you definitely, after you eat or drink, you don't want to lay down because that will just exacerbate your situation. It'll bring that acid up. So sitting up after you eat, waiting to take your antacid, those things are good situations for your stomach. But most of our cells in our body, most of our tissues want a very steady state around seven. In order to do this, we have different compounds in our body that are called buffers. Buffers give us the ability to, when a situation becomes acidic or becomes basic, these buffers come in and they try to neutralize as much as they can the situation to keep us within that homeostasis. So we have a lot of different kinds of buffers that are in our body. Many of them are found within our blood so that they can travel from one place where they're made to another place where they need to neutralize a situation. And the way that they do that is depending on what kind of buffer, they might be a more basic buffer to soak up acids, or they might be a more acidic buffer to soak up bases. And they're going into bond with the hydroxide ion, the OH negative, or the hydrogen ion, the H plus, and trying to make a homeostasis situation back to normal. You could find carbonic acid within our blood. 
just one of the many, as I mentioned, buffers that are in our blood that will try and keep our blood at about neutral. And like I mentioned before, that blood is about seven on the pH scale because it does have a lot of different kinds of buffers within the blood to make sure that our blood, which touches every single cell within our body, that all of our cells remain neutral and they can help, those buffers can help in any situation. All right, so a few questions to think about. I don't think I have these in here, right? Okay, so these just are, I put in to think about. What kind of bond holds the atoms of one single water together? Is it the ionic, the covalent, or the hydrogen? Hydrogen. So we're talking about one water, not a water to a water. Not a water to a water, but what holds this together? Covalent. Covalent, okay. So you might find a question like this on your exam. So if you wanted to take a picture <clears throat> of this question, it might be a good idea. Yeah. No, no. Oh, okay. You're asking that. Yeah. 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 So one water is held together by a covalent bond. Now, the wording of this, we can just change that around just a teeny bit. We change like single to many or more than one, that makes us a very different question. So this, for example, what kind of bonds form between water molecules? Hydrogen. Right, so then there's your hydrogen bonds. So again, if you wanna take a picture of this one. These are two questions that would be a good test question and making sure you know and understand the difference will be very important for you. Oh. <laughs> um, this, I don't have this in your notes. Um, this is another thing, maybe take a picture of this too, but um, this is really great. This would be a great thing to uh, either write out or print out and cut all of these like little, the type of interaction cut those apart, and then these, cut them apart and do like a matching game. It's a great way to, to just kind of summarize the difference between the ionic bond, the non-polar covalent bond, and the polar covalent bond, and the hydrogen bond. Just another good tool. All right. Okay, let's move on to chapter three. Chapter three is about biochemistry. And what we mean by that is we just studied a little bit of basics of chemistry, and now we're gonna add in biological molecules. We kind of ta talked a bit about biochemistry, just kind of touching into that water will bond with other compounds like proteins or fats or nucleic acids. And so we're gonna take a look at why that happens. So we're gonna start out with carbon. Carbon is probably the most prevalent atom in our body with the exception of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen, the reason for it is its atomic structure. So we're going to explore carbon's atomic structure again. Oh, before we get there, let's talk about when you have carbon in your body and you have hydrogens bonded to it, we call that an organic molecule. So I know if you go to the store and you have the organic section, it really gets down to a very chemical basis that what you're talking about when we're talking about like organic food is that organic food is gonna have more of just pure this without having things like pesticides, insecticides, growth hormones, um, other chemicals that we add to our food. So we're gonna have less of those things in organic food and more of just pure like carbon bonded to hydrogen and other atoms as well. Organic molecules are very important. They determine our structure and function. And when we're talking about organic molecules, we're looking at four groups of organic molecules that we're going to explore, which will be the lipids or the fats, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the nucleic acids. Inorganic molecules, even though they're inorganic, does not make them unimportant. Water, is an inorganic molecule, 
super important to us. We've discussed a lot. We talked a little bit about salt. Salt's an organic molecule. We need salt, as I mentioned last week. We need salt to help our muscles to contract and relax, and we have muscles that line almost every organ, tissue in our body. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, we breathe out, we get rid of our carbon dioxide so that autotrophs, producers like plants, algae, cyanobacteria can take up that carbon dioxide with sunlight and water and produce food for us to eat. So inorganic molecules, super important too, just a differentiation in that they do not, you can see each of these, do not have carbon bonded to hydrogen. Carbon dioxide has carbon, but does it have carbon and hydrogen? No. So it's an organic, and it's, it's an inorganic molecule. Okay, so carbon, let's get into the structure of carbon. Let's go back to our Bohr model of carbon. So carbon has an atomic number of six and an atomic weight of 12. Let's map out how many protons, electrons, and neutrons it has. So this is just a little review from last week. The atomic number tells us the number of protons. The number of protons implies the number of electrons so that we have a balance of our positive and negative charges. And the way we get our neutrons is we take our atomic weight, subtract our atomic number. So we take our atomic weight of 12, we subtract our atomic number of six. We're going to take our protons and our neutrons and put them in the nucleus. And then we have six electrons to place, so we'll start on our K shell. We fill up our K shell with two electrons. That leaves us four electrons to put in our L shell. So there's our six electrons. So carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. If you remember last week, I said that the number that of electrons that an atom or an element needs to have a full outer shell is the number of covalent bonds it can form. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, therefore it needs four to be full. So it can form four covalent bonds.
So what carbon is going to do is each of the four Each of the four are going to share with someone else's outer shell. So that when we're taking a look at our position <clears throat> one, two, three, and four, those would all be different compounds or molecules that can bond covalently to carbon. get those four covalent bonds, the top, the sides, and the bottom. So it's kind of like what we saw here when we were looking at the hydrogen bonding capabilities of water, is that water can start getting things around it, and things that have carbon as their base also can start wrapping stuff around them as well. And the more bonding you have in an organism, the more that that organism, who is mostly water, is going to start to also add to that property of adhesion. Or it's going to, the adhesion will add to the property of cohesion, and then you start to get these more solid feeling structures. I love in biology that the simplicity of the chemistry allows for the complexity that we are. And that's one of the, I think, most amazing things about organisms is that really at the core of all that's going on with us and how complex we are, it's just so simple. So how many atoms can carbon bond with? Four. Good. Okay, can bond with four. Another good test question, okay? Very simple, important concept. All right, so carbon has four electrons in its outer shell, which means it bonds with up to four other atoms. What happens then is that the carbons can start to do this and this and this and this, and they start to form these really cool, simple structures, like carbons can bond to each other, and then in the other three or two positions that they can bond with other things. But you can see that there is each of these has one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then if we look at what they can also do is that they can form ring-like structures where they can bond to each other to a closed loop system. And this is going to give a lot more stability because this, while it's long, it could you know, like get broken in the middle and be harder to do. But this, like a ring structure, gives it a lot of strength as well. These rings and chains, we call them, are the backbones of all the complexity that we are. Okay, so what goes on these other parts? The things that carbon bonds with that are not carbon, they are called functional groups because they're usually bigger than something small like water. What goes on those little openings determines their chemical reactivity, how they are going to react with other atoms, molecules, and compounds.
there's another additional thing that gives us structure and function within our cells, is what functional groups are attached to those chains and rings. So here are some that you're going to be working with in lab today. If it's just a simple pop on a hydrogen, that's called a hydrogen functional group. The OH is called hydroxyl. Carboxyl is when you have, now this is where um, you can see that the carbon will be bonded to one, two, three things, but that is because carbon can also found, form, carbon can also form a double covalent bond with one of the atoms or molecules. So you have still one, two, three, four bonds there. So this is called carboxyl. Amino is a nitrogen with two hydrogens. We get into some of the bigger groups like the phosphate or phosphorus functional group. Um, and then if you have a carbon with three hydrogens, it's called methyl. Okay, so how do we put together a fat or a carbohydrate, a lipid, and nucleic acid? We start with very simple atoms or elements called monomers. And when they come together in chains or rings, they build polymers. Mono refers to one. So mono means one. Poly means many. So single monomers, one, atoms, molecules, compounds, will build into poly, many in a chain or a ring. Small subunits of organic molecules are the monomers. For every group that we look at, we're going to look at the four biomolecule groups, the fats and lipids, the proteins, the carbohydrates, and the nucleic acids. All of them will have their own unique monomer group. And when they attach together, those monomers, they're going to make larger polymer groups. So it's going to be the same for, like I mentioned, all four groups, except for meaning that monomers build polymers, but the monomers will be different for each of the four special groups. Okay. So what do you think, out of this list, what do you think would have to be removed from two biomolecule groups in order for a bond to form between them? Just based on something we've been talking about a lot, do you think it's carboxyl, methyl, hydroxide, water, or hydrogen, water. if you were guessing. Yes, so water. Water is really important to make and break organic molecules. It is the core necessity of our metabolism, all the chemical reactions that happen in our cells. Got to have that water. We've got to be hydrated. So we're gonna take a look at the two processes for making and breaking organic molecules. They are called dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis. I know these words might sound a little scary at first, but break them down. Dehydration, what does that mean? You're going to lose what? Water. water, right? Okay, so dehydration. We know that word, right? Dehydration, lose water. Synthesis. When you synthesize something, you make something. So the words dehydration synthesis, even though you might be like, oh my gosh, that sounds like really complex and scary, it just means that we're going to make something by losing water. So in order to make larger molecules, water has to dehydrate up or come out. So remember that, just break it down. Make it easy on yourself. Hydrolysis maybe is not as like clear in terms of is it making or breaking. So if you know dehydration synthesis is making molecules, then just go like, okay, dehydration synthesis makes, then hydrolysis breaks them apart. Hydrolysis breaks organic molecules. The word hydro, at least hydro is in there that indicates water is going to be important to be put in 
It'll be the opposite. These two are opposite reactions. Dehydrating, getting rid of water to make something larger. Hydrolysis is the opposite, so it means we're putting water in, we're hydrating, and we think hydro, hydrate, to break apart larger molecules. So, as I've been saying over and over and over again, that water is super duper duper important to how our cells function because we're constantly in need of breaking things down, like our food inputs, we're breaking down so that it can supply energy and nutrients to the rest of our cells. And then we also need to break, uh, put things back together. If you get an injury, you need to put something back together, right? So water, super duper duper critical to us. That's why you have to always stay well hydrated. So biological molecules are joined together in that dehydration synthesis by removing water or broken apart by hydrolysis by adding that water in. We're going to look at the dehydration synthesis and hydrolysis of all the major biomolecule groups. But first we'll just look at very simplistic means of how this is done. So dehydration synthesis, what we're doing again, dehydrating, removing water, and we're forming a bond to make a larger molecule. So water's coming out and two things are coming together. That's the basics of what you need to know here. What are we adding together? Two monomers, two basic compounds. We're gonna add them together. And adding them together, we're gonna dehydrate by one loses an OH and the other one loses an H. So one loses an OH and H and then that forms water, like what we saw when we looked at the pH scale. And then they form a covalent bond between them. It looks like this. So let's just say whatever this is and this is, these are some kind of, and we'll get into carbohydrates, which are indicated by a ring structure. On one of the functional groups, you've got an OH, and then you have the same thing over here, because they are the same monomer. So from one of the functional groups, you're gonna lose an H, and from the other molecule, you're gonna lose an OH. And so when you lose these, water is lost or dehydrated out. What you're going to be left with is you're going to be left with this bond right here that's going to attach to this oxygen that was left behind. So please notice, this is kind of critical, is that when water comes out, you have this oxygen left behind. So you have a little oxygen bridge between the two monomers. You're going to be building these today. And so what I'm looking at, for example, like I know and you'll learn soon, that carbohydrates are usually indicated by rings or can be, that when I see two rings and you make your two ring structures and I see them put together, if I just see a bond between your two ring structures, I'll go, no, 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 you're missing the oxygen bridge. Because when you have these two hydroxyl groups sticking off, and you lose an H and an OH to make water, don't forget that this one is left behind. And that oxygen left behind becomes a little covalent bonded bridge between the two monomers. So again, here's your dehydration, your dehydration, and this is your synthesis. <clears throat> All right, hydrolysis, we're going in the opposite direction. We've already got our monomers are bonded together to make a polymer. Like when you eat food, you take in a bunch of polymers and starting in your mouth, some of that becomes broken down into monomer groups and then it goes through your esophagus and your stomach and gets broken down further and further and you get a lot of this breaking down. We're going to put water into that situation. Water is going to break apart so that we end up with a hydroxide ion and a hydrogen ion, an OH and an H. 
When that water breaks apart, an OH is going to go to one of the monomers and the H is going to go to the other. So here, what's going to be happening, the opposite of what we saw before, So here, we're going to break some bonds. So you're going to add the H to one of them, and the OH to the other. You can see that here now. This one has an OH group. This one has the OH group. That was the breaking of our water and the breaking of our two monomers, excuse me, the breaking of our polymer to make our two monomers. So just the opposite, we could just change this back and forth that when it goes this way, When our reaction goes in that direction, it's hydrolysis. If we change the arrow and we went from our monomers and we de dehydrate out our water, that becomes dehydration synthesis in this direction. So again, just opposite reactions. And then remember again, the dehydration, dehydrate, takes the water out to make something larger synthesize to make. Dehydrate to make. Hydrolysis is add water in to break. So sim the simple basics of how molecules are made and broken. Okay, so let's take a look at our four biomolecule groups. We'll get the carbohydrates, the lipids, the proteins, and then the nucleic acids. There's BIO. Remember, BIO means living. And so here we're talking about the molecules that are most important to living things, the biomolecules. I know sometimes that might sound scary, but again, break it down. Use what you know. Go back to the basics. All right, so let's take a look at carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are composed of one carbon for every two hydrogens for every one oxygen. That's where you get that one to two to one ratio. If you've ever heard that before, it means for every one carbon, you have two hydrogens and one oxygen. These are our, our quickest energy sources. We can break these down really, really quick to get energy really fast. So monosaccharides, mono, one, saccharide, sugar. These are what we would refer to as very simple sugars, our quickest forms of energy. Glucose. Glucose can most easily go into the process of cellular respiration. So again, all these big words, right? Cellular means it's at the cellular level. Respiration means breathing. When we're talking about cellular respiration, we're talking about taking in oxygen, that our cells are getting oxygen from our blood 
And as a product of taking in that oxygen, what, it ha what happens is we break down very simple things like glucose, fructose. These go right in with oxygen to cellular respiration. That the breathing, the taking in of oxygen. What happens when you break down glucose and cellular respiration is we give off carbon dioxide that goes into your blood and it goes back to your lungs and then you breathe it out. So respiration, the act of, there's this big part of it that happens in our respiratory system, but the most important part of our respiration happens at the cellular level. And the whole reason why we have a respiratory system is to take in oxygen so that we can break down our food. So breathing is a huge important part of feeding ourselves. These go in first. They can go into cellular respiration right away. They can go in the front door. Glucose, so sugar. Athletes, like the um, Olympic athletes this summer, any of you who are athletes probably know that you do a thing called carb loading. And carb loading means carbohydrates, that you're eating a high carb diet because these things Carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, things that have glucose, they go right into cellular respiration. So they're very quick sources of energy. So like when I used to play basketball, I did probably a really unhealthy thing, but a smart thing in a way, is that I always used to have a Coke and a Snickers bar before every game. Because I knew that I was gonna have the sugars from that Coke and that Snickers bar go right into cellular respiration and over the next two hours, I would have this good, quick energy source happening in my body that would get me through that competition. So these are the fastest things that go in, the most simple. Um, also, just to mention, um, our RNA, you're probably familiar with these terms. We're going to get into them in more detail, a little bit more detail today, but a lot more at the end of the semester. RNA and DNA. Uh, have all the instructions and the way to make all the important things in our body, they have simple sugars as a component of them as well. So our nucleic acids also contain simple sugars. When you have a monosaccharide and a monosaccharide and a monosaccharide go through dehydration synthesis, they form poly, many, saccharides, sugars in a chain. So these are our complex carbohydrates. So these would be important things. The complex carbs would be part of that carb loading that like the night or the morning of, athletes will want to have like a lot of bread, pasta, things that are going to be full of polysaccharides, many simple sugars in chains, so that those overnight can be broken down. They can fill up your blood with sugar. They can fill up your liver with extra sugar sources. So like you, if you have something like you're moving, you know tomorrow you're gonna move and you're gonna be doing a lot of activity, really good thing to have a spaghetti dinner or have waffles, something that has a lot of starch, potatoes, pasta, grains, all of those things will allow for your body to be full of sugars the next day, the next morning, have something like uh, Gatorade that's got sugar in it. And so now you've got a lot of sugar sources to help you get through that activity. And it doesn't have to just be for athletes. We all do hard things. So if you're doing something strenuous, the carbohydrates are very important to focus on as your food source. All right, so glucose, this is glucose. Now this I think is funny, right? This is simple. This is a simple glucose. It looks pretty complex though, right? So even when we're talking about our biomolecules, the monomers are often pretty complex. You can see glucose, there it is. It, it makes a chain of carbons with itself. It has one, two, three, four, five carbons in its ring, but it also has an oxygen. So five carbons and an oxygen. You all are gonna build two of these as a group today in lab. Each of, so oxygen, because it needs, it, oxygen has six electrons in its outer shell. It needs two more to be full. 
has six, needs one, two, and only has two bonds with the carbons on either side of it. But each of these carbons needs four in their outer shell to be full. So you've got one bond, two bonds, and then they get each a hydrogen, a hydroxyl group, excuse me, a hydrogen group, and a OH, a hydroxyl group. So you can see with carbon one, two, three, and four, they each have a hydrogen group and a hydroxyl group. A hydrogen group, hydroxyl group, hydrogen group, hydroxyl group, hydrogen group, hydroxyl group. Carbon five has a little bit bigger of a functional group attached to it. So carbon five, the one that is next to the oxygen, it has a carbon with two hydrogens, with an oxygen, and the oxygen has a hydrogen. I point out these carbons being one, two, three, four, five, because these are going to be really important of which carbons are involved in making two of these glucoses come together. So you're going to pay close attention to what carbons you're utilizing, one, two, three, four, or five, when you're doing your dehydration synthesis in the lab today. Fructose. Coming found in fruit, simple sugar found in fruit. And then as I mentioned, our RNA and DNA, our nucleic acids, as a part of those monomers, they do have sugars in them. All right, so let's talk about when we have two monomers that come together in a dehydration synthesis. One, two. Two for di. Di means two. So a disaccharide, two monomers, come together in a dehydration synthesis. An example of a common disaccharide is lactose, which is found in milk. Lactose is a dehydration synthesis between a galactose and a glucose. So again, di means two. Two monosaccharides, single sugars, monosaccharides, single sugars come together to make a disaccharide or two monomers in a bond, a covalent bond. So, here we have a glucose and a fructose. They undergo dehydration synthesis to make sucrose. Sucrose is often found in plants. Some of the glucose produced in photosynthesis bonds with fructose, the other kind of sugar found in plants, or I shouldn't say the other, another monomer found in plants. And so you get sucrose when you have a glucose and a fructose come together in a dehydration synthesis. Here you can see that here is the oxygen. This is the big functional group. So this is carbon one right here. Um, in the illustrations, just out. that when they draw a ring, they don't sometimes include the carbons on there. They are implied. So just know that each of those corners is a carbon on the ring. and a fructose come together, it's like a recipe happens in terms of well, which carbon on the ring loses the H off of its OH group and on the fructose, which one loses the OH off of its carbon. So we have carbon one, two, three, four, and five. Glucose is going to lose its hydrogen group 
off of its carbon one. Start in oxygen, then the next one's carbon one. Carbon five has this big functional group on it. When we take a look at fructose, we have carbon one, two, three, four. Carbon four, oh, I should actually put right here. It's carbon four that loses the OH group. So these, when you lose the H off of carbon one of glucose and the OH off of fructose, carbon four, that's your dehydration part. And your dehydration then shows <coughs> there's your water that's dehydrated. What you're left with on the fructose is this bond right here. And this bond right here is going to bond to the oxygen left when the hydrogen comes off of the OH group of oxygen. And so then you're seeing that form there. So when you're in lab, read the directions very carefully because it's going to be important that which carbons are losing what. I mean, to make water, you could just lose, couldn't we just lose this hydrogen? We could, but that's not the way it works. It's the hydrogen off of the OH group. So, right, this carbon one has two hydrogens available, but it loses the hydrogen off of the hydroxyl group. That's very important there. You can't just pick like, I'm gonna lose this hydrogen off of carbon three and this OH off of their carbon three. It doesn't work that way. It's a precise recipe when we are doing these dehydration synthesis. What about? Syntheses. What about two? Two just stays by like how it is. Yeah, two, three, four, they're not involved. Just carbon one of glucose and carbon four of fructose. Yeah, good. And then also important, like I'll walk over, you'll have your two rings set up and I can just walk over and be like, I can look really quick and go carbon one, carbon four, okay. But when you take your two glucoses together, they're gonna do a carbon four OH to a carbon one H off of an OH group. And so I'm looking for three things when I take a look at, when you do the dehydration synthesis of the two glucoses, is I'm looking for one, is there an oxygen bridge between? If you just have a covalent bond with no oxygen, I know that you didn't do it correctly. So it's very particular. The other thing that I'm going to look at is that I'm going to look at and make sure that I'm going to very quickly look and go, okay, there's the oxygen, the functional group that makes that a five because the five carbon, the carbon five has the big functional group, which means on the other side of the oxygen is the carbon one, the carbon one, two, and then again, I'm going to look at and go, okay, I know, oh, I know that this is the carbon four. So I'm going to look for a four to a one. And so I can quickly tell whether you did it right or you did not. Okay, I think. And just, let's just finish up carbohydrates. One more minute. Um, polysaccharides is when we keep adding more and more on. Keep adding more monomers on. Poly means many. Saccharide sugar, many sugars together in chains. Anything with starch in it, we're talking about like potatoes or um, wheat products, um, bread, these have a lot of calories to them. What you can think about when you're thinking about calories is all of these bonds. 
all of these bonds are potential energy. If you remember back a couple weeks ago, we said that bonds hold energy. And then when bonds are broken apart, they release energy. And so when you eat something like a big loaf of bread, like you get a baguette and you're like, oh, this is so nice and it's warm and soft and chewy and you love it. And you eat like the whole baguette, it's got a lot of calories in it because it has a lot of bonds. So when we can equate things to calories, we're thinking about, oh, this has, look at, like each of these has a lot of bonds and then they're bonded to each other, bonded to each other. And then they go in chains across and up and over and the chains go up and over and over. So there's lots and lots and lots of calories because there's lots and lots of bonds. It's another reason why, what I said before, if you're going to do something with a lot of energy the next day, have a meal with pasta or um, bread or potatoes because you want to have all of this energy available to you the next day. And then glycogen, when we have leftover, when our blood gets filled up with glucose, the leftover glucose goes into our liver and becomes glycogen. It's very similar in nature to starch, where it's like chains and chains and chains and chains and chains of glucoses. And then kind of like the big, big, a big, big, big one that has lots of energy, but the energy is very unusable, is called cellulose, which makes up a lot of the structure of plants, but also makes up a lot of the structure of your, any of your fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, anything that's produced by a plant. So those things are really important to eat because they have high cellulose, or what we would equate to as fiber. And fiber is really important to give our digestive system a physical workout. Just like maybe like thinking about I'm physically working out. So super important, the muscles that line your digestive system, it is critically important you give them a workout every day. So eating a lot more plant material will give you that proper workout that your digestive system muscles need. We are eating a lot less and less and less plant material and more processed food because what processed food is it comes in it breaks all this apart and makes you have less fiber in your diet. A lot of times students will say like, I'm gonna go on this cleanse or I just know people be like, I'm gonna do this juice cleanse, it's really healthy for me. And I'm like, just why don't you just, instead of juicing stuff, actually eat the fruit, eat the vegetables, eat the stuff that's in the juice. A lot of juices take all of this important exercise for your digestive system out. If you ever want to cleanse your body, all you have to do is eat a ton of fruits and vegetables. That's like the best cleanse you can do, is feed your body the nutrients that are healthy and also the fiber that's healthy. And a lot of these things, it's like when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, right? Okay, and a couple more complex carbohydrates. Chitin. It's in the shells of crabs, lobsters, insects, very highly bonded together. Very hard to break that down. If you eat shellfish, would you eat like a lobster? Would you eat like the whole lobster? No, you like crack it all apart, right? You pull the muscle or the meat out and you eat the meat and you throw the shell away because you can't digest it. It's also sharp and hard, so we wouldn't want to eat that. All right, we'll stop there. All right, so today you are going to do in 